I'm Dr. Olivia Scheller, Medical Director at the Institute of Medical Education and Research. Welcome to IMA Reporting Live from American Society of Hematology 2011 meeting. So I have with me today Dr. Sagar Loniel, Professor of Hematology and Medical Oncology at the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University. Thank you, Dr. Loniel, for being here today. Thank you. I wanted to ask you some, there's been exciting news that's come out in multiple myeloma, and I wanted to ask you some questions about that exciting news here at ASH. And the first question that I have for you is, how does all these new array of agents, and how do they actually impact the treatment um, for relapsed myeloma um, in patients? Yeah, so I think um, we do uh, have a huge number of new drugs and new targets in myeloma that are really helping us to approach this area of relapsed and refractory disease in new ways. And I'll break them down into four basic categories. The first category I think to talk about is the HDAC inhibitors or the histone deacetylase inhibitors. And there are two prototype molecules that are in phase two and phase three trials. One is virinostat and the other is panobinostat. And Varinostat has been uh, done in a phase two trial evaluating patients with bortezomib resistant disease. And in that trial today, uh, David Siegel presented data that suggested a response rate of somewhere around 18 to 20 percent for PR or better. But about 50 percent of patients had stable disease or better with a durability of about um, uh, three to five months, somewhere in that ballpark there. Now, while that number may be a little bit disappointing oh, in, in its basic uh, premise, I think you need to think about who these patients were. These were patients who had had a median of five prior lines of therapy, had been diagnosed many, many years ago, and actually a couple of the patients in the trial had had more than 10 prior lines of therapy. So the fact that you can get any kind of a response at all with this combination is really quite striking. So I think what we need to work on is trying to identify the best subsets of patients to respond to a varinostat bortezomib type combination. There's also data in a randomized phase three trial that's going to be presented that looks at bortezomib alone versus bortezomib plus varinostat. And in that trial, we did show an improvement in progression-free survival and improvement in overall response rate, but there were certainly a lot of side effects associated with that administration as well. So I think with varinostat, we need to do a little bit more work in terms of dose and schedule to really optimize that. Now the other HDAC inhibitor is panobinostat. Uh, and panobinostat is being presented at this meeting as part of a phase two trial in bortezomib-resistant patients. And what Paul Richardson is showing is a response rate of about 25 to 30 percent. Progression-free survival data is still too early to really know. And it appears that some of the side effects may be a little different for panobinostat compared to varinostat. So we need longer follow-up, and the phase three trial will hopefully finish in the next few months, and then we'll have additional data in a randomized setting. The other categories to talk about are second-generation proteasome inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing at this meeting is updates of data on carfilzomib, which is a second-generation proteasome inhibitor. And in that trial, what we've managed to see is that the response rate in bortezomib-naive patients is almost 50 percent, if not slightly higher than that, and that the progression-free survival for that group is really quite good, and there continues to be no significant neuropathy signal for the use of carfilzomib. Also very, very encouraging data. What we also saw at this meeting was the first presentation on an oral proteasome inhibitor. And Paul Richardson presented data on MLN9708, which is an oral inhibitor. And this drug actually also shows responses even in patients that had neuropathy with bortezomib before and does not appear to have a significant neuropathy signal. So we've got a couple of new second generation agents that I think are going to be really exciting for patients because they have fewer side effects. The third category to talk about is new IMIDs, or immunomodulatory agents. And that prototype drug right now is pomalidomide. And we know that thalidomide and lenalidomide are clearly very active drugs, are important in all phases of myeloma therapy, but there are subsets of patients that are resistant to both bortezomib and lenalidomide. And what we've seen in this meeting is that pomalidomide is, it appears to be able to consistently overcome lenalidomide resistance in about a third of patients. So again, great options for patients who are looking at really limited options, uh, you know, as of two, two or three years ago. The fourth category, and the final one that I'll, that I'll touch on in the relapse setting, is monoclonal antibodies. And this is an area where every other area of oncology has really benefited from the use of monoclonal antibodies except myeloma. And we finally, I think, have, have an antibody in a drug called elotuzumab. And elotuzumab is an anti-CS1 antibody. And what we learned about elotuzumab is that by itself it may not do a whole lot, but add in a little bit of lenalidomide and low-dose dex, and it appears to augment immune function 
and that really makes this antibody quite good. In the phase two trial we did, the median progression-free survival has not been reached with 14 months of follow-up, and the response rate's about 82% overall, which is, I think, quite good and quite comparable and almost identical to what we showed in the phase one trial. So I think we do have lots of neat stuff to talk about in the relapse disease setting. Very exciting news that came out in Relapse Refactory, so we have to keep an eye on that data coming in the near future, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so it's very important to talk about younger patients and patient in induction therapy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the data that came out at this meeting? So induction therapy, I think more and more we're starting to realize that what you do in the beginning can have a major impact on what happens for the rest of a patient's disease course. And just looking at an old set of data that was presented at this or updated at this, Dr. San Miguel from, uh, from Salamanca actually presented a five-year follow-up on the VISTA trial. And as you recall, VISTA was MPV, melphalan, prednisone, and bortezomib versus melphalan and prednisone. And what's really quite striking about this analysis is that he demonstrated that even with a median follow-up of 60 months now, the group that initially got randomized to MPV, melphalan, prednisone, and bortezomib, continue to have an improved survival over the group that initially got MP. And that means that even with subsequent access to bortezomib, they were not able to overcome that survival decrement they got by not getting the better combination up front. And there's a number of sub-analyses that were presented, but I think I fully agree with Dr. San Miguel when he says we really need to put our best foot forward because that sort of sets the stage for how patients are going to do for the rest of their life. Now, other data that's being presented is an update of the CRD data, which combines carfilzomib with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And what we're seeing from Dr. Jakubowiak in this analysis is really that patients are able to stay on three-drug therapy beyond four cycles of therapy, and very few, if any of them, are having to have reductions in carfilzomib dosing as a consequence of developing neuropathy, which was something that we saw previously with bortezomib or RVD-based uh, approaches for newly diagnosed patients. Now again, to take that twist of a new proteasome inhibitor one step further, MLN9708, the oral proteasome inhibitor that I mentioned earlier, was also presented in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And this analysis shows very impressive responses. 100% of patients have responded in the phase one and phase two portion of the study. And tolerability has really been quite good below the maximum tolerated dose. So I think those kinds of approaches have really been quite striking. That's wonderful news for the younger patients. And also, it's very important to talk about the elderly population as well and the non-transplantable patients. And there was data that came out here at ASH. Can you tell us a little bit about that data? Yeah, yeah. And the MPV regimen that I mentioned before is an older non-transplant eligible. I, I mentioned it earlier because I think it does set the principle of putting your best treatment forward. What we saw in addition to that uh, VISTA update was also data from Dr. Palumbo in what's called the MM015 trial. And the MM015 trial was a three-arm randomized trial for patients over the age of 65 that looked at MPR, melphalan, prednisone, and lenalidomide with len maintenance, MPR with no maintenance, or just MP. And what we clearly saw with a longer follow-up now, almost of, of over a year and a half now, is that the group that gets continuous therapy, meaning MPR with lenalidomide maintenance, appear to have the best progression-free survival uh, of, of all three groups, meaning continuous therapy appears to be very active. What he showed for the first time today is that if you look at patients between 65 and 75, that even those who got MPR without maintenance did better than just melphalan and prednisone. And this is the first time he's really shown this data, which again speaks to the concept of old drug, melphalan, in combination with new drug, lenalidomide, as being superior to just old drugs alone. Um, in the older than 75 patient population, that benefit was less clear, probably because there was more toxicity in that older patient population, and we need to think about adjusting doses and schedules. Now, the third trial, I think, that really addresses older patients that was presented or updated at this meeting was also from the Spanish myeloma group, and what they showed very nicely was an update of their previous trial comparing VTP, bortezomib with thalidomide and prednisone, versus MPV, melphalan, prednisone, and bortezomib. And what they focused on this time was maintenance. They looked at bortezomib thal, VT, versus bortezomib prednisone, VP, in the maintenance setting. And I think they showed benefits for ongoing therapy. What I think was a little more concerning was the fact that patients with high-risk disease did not appear to get significant 
benefit out of the use of bortezomib in the maintenance setting. Now that's a different story than what we've been telling up until now. And one of the big caveats about the Spanish trial is that they gave the bortezomib in a very different schedule. They gave the standard 1, 4, 8, and 11 dosing every three months. So basically you got four doses of bortezomib every three months. And I just don't think that that's enough therapy to really be able to suppress a high-risk clone. So I'm not sure I would throw bortezomib out, but it certainly makes us think about how to do it in the relapse setting. So you mentioned maintenance therapy. Here at ASH, there was uh, quite a bit of data that came out on maintenance therapy and consolidation therapy. Can you uh, review that data as well? Yeah, so in terms of the maintenance and consolidation, I think that this is really a very uh, important area to think about. And it, it gets back to that original point about putting your best foot forward. We know that there are clones of cells that evolve and divide over time that may change over the period of, of treatment. And what maintenance and consolidation allows us to do is to try and reduce disease burden to lower and lower levels with the idea that ultimately we're going to talk about curing patients. We know that in a high-risk subset of patients, you can get a complete remission, but they very rapidly relapse and the disease becomes progressively more difficult to treat. And so the idea of consolidating or treating a, a high-risk patient with maintenance therapy, I think, does make a lot of sense. The CLGB trial, which looked at LEN versus placebo maintenance, is now showing an improvement in overall survival for patients who receive maintenance lenalidomide. The IFM study does not show a maintenance, uh, does not show an improvement in overall survival, but does show a doubling of progression-free survival. What I think is really quite interesting about the IFM study is that they gave consolidation before maintenance, whereas the U.S. trial didn't do that. And perhaps it was the use of consolidation that really uh, lessen the survival benefit that we see from that CALG or from the IFM experience overall. And when we talk about maintenance therapy, one of the issues that's coming up more and more now is the issue of second primary malignancy. If you use lenalidomide as a maintenance strategy, do you have a higher risk of developing another cancer? And it's clear from the randomized trials that that risk does go up. But does that risk go up enough to warrant not using maintenance? And in many ways, I think that depends on what the risk of relapse is for that patient. We can have a lot of concerns about second malignancies, but our real concern should be the primary malignancy, the first malignancy, and that's myeloma. And in a high-risk patient, I think the risk-benefit ratio really does favor maintenance in that situation. So there's a lot of data that's coming out that really um, supports a lot of research, you know, and support for patients. So thank you very much for reviewing all the data that happened here at ASH 2011. Thank you very much for being with us.